lived with slavery and segregation. 345 years, we waited a long time for freedom. Yes, Dr. King did not give up. He did not give up. We can't stop now. We have to continue to do the work in the community. It's just too depressing to think that things aren't gonna change. You have to be optimistic to do this kind of work. I sure hope we can get there. He has left a legacy for us, but just to hear his voice and him say to us, you know what, you're gonna get there. Um, you still have to keep pressing forward. It's not a question just of Dr. King's dream. He would be the first to say that it didn't originate with me, but don't let it end with me. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's a great day for Virginia. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. No justice! No peace! Martin Luther King Jr. got to this point for me just so I can speak. I truly believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that all people are created equal, and that we all have work to do to create a more perfect union. I believe that with everything inside of me. Welcome to the 43rd Annual Martin Luther King Jr. Community Leaders Award Celebration, sponsored by Virginia Union University and Dominion Energy. Welcome to the Community Leaders Celebration to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Virginia Union University has hosted this event for 43 years along with Living the Dream Incorporated. This year's commemoration is in partnership with the United Negro College Fund, WTVR-TV and WTKR-TV. And a special thanks to our sponsoring partner, Dominion Energy. For the first time, this event will be televised in Richmond and Hampton Roads and live streamed over social media. Over the next hour, we'll honor the legacy and work of Dr. King by recognizing six community leaders and organizations who work tirelessly to realize Dr. King's dream of racial, social, and economic equality. Our first honoree receives the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Beloved Community Award in Faith and Education. Dr. Gould Champ and her congregation, Faith Community Baptist Church, have worked tirelessly with Richmond communities, Fairfield, Wickham, and Creighton Courts, as well as the greater East End area. Now, when COVID-19 physically shut the school doors down, the church realized they had to come up with a way to keep the students connected with the classroom. Well, through Dr. Gouldchamp's leadership, the church was able to open their doors and start a program called Stay Connected, Stay On Point. And they were able to help students with technology and academic support. I chose the MLK quote uh, where he talks about faith is taking the first a step without seeing this, this whole staircase. Because I think that that is the essence of what faith is. That is the essence of how I've lived my life. Uh, this church would never have been founded if we had been looking to see the whole staircase. None of the things that we do here would we be doing if we were looking to see the whole staircase. Faith Community Baptist Church is a staple in this area because we were founded to serve this area in particular, and especially uh, all of the surrounding courts around us. Dr. Martin Luther King's vision is one that I've embraced since childhood and uh, learned it in the black church, of which I've been a member since I was baptized at age seven, so about 67 years. Um, but one of the things about King's message is that he helped us to understand that our mission as believers was never to be inside of a building. It was always to be about the enhancement of people and building lives and building a community. And so even as God gave the vision for this church, Faith Community Baptist Church, it was with the empower, part of our vision statement says that we are here for the empowerment of people not just spiritually, but economically, educationally, and socially. So this six, right? And we're gonna add three more. And so when we heard that they would not be able to go in person, we already knew it was going to be a problem, that our children were already at risk and they were gonna get further behind. And so we were driven to, we can't just allow that to happen without putting out some kind of effort 
to uh, help and assist in any way that we can. And that's when uh, the vision was given to me for Stay Connected, Stay On Point, to keep them connected to other children as well as to help them stay on point educationally. I think Dr. King, if he were to be here during the times in which we live, he would be greatly disappointed, greatly heartbroken. But I know that he would be speaking words of hope and helping us to see that uh, hope always trumps chaos and all the other kinds of hopeless situations, those things that appear to be hopeless. And I know that he would be leading the charge in helping the church, especially the African American church, to know that our place is out front. Our place is not silence. Our place is not to just look and observe, but our place is to determine what, how are we gonna be a part of the solution to what's going on. He stayed on campus that Friday night. The next day, he had to go to Bird Airport to catch his flight back to Montgomery. And I was asked to drive him, to motor him from the campus to Bird Airport. He knew that violence couldn't win. So he talked, he said, he said, um, unnecessary suffering is redemptive. And he got people to believe that. And people went away doing that. That made a difference. And everybody has seen, and it, we, we, we celebrate him, we celebrate what he was about because he really made a difference. He shook the status quo. And so many other things sprung off from it, in politics, in government, in education, and it's still, Black Lives Matter is a part of it, it's good of it. So the, 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 the things that are taking place now that we are just seeing have their roots in what he did many, many years ago. Dr. King once said, one of life's most persistent and urgent questions is, what are you doing to help others? Our honoree for the beloved Community Award for Health Equity represents that ideology and goes to the Sisters Network, Central Virginia. Founded in 2007, the Sisters Network, Central Virginia is a breast cancer survivorship organization dedicated to spreading awareness about the devastating impact of breast cancer in the African-American community where women are 42% more likely to die of the disease. The Sisters Network provides fiscal, medical, and emotional support. They're best known for their annual Gift for Life Walk Block Health Fair, where they canvas underserved communities and hand out breast cancer information. Dr. King's quote, life's most persistent question is, what are you doing for others? It doesn't always have to be monumental. This is what we do as an organization. We want to help others through the journey that we've been through and help them to be inspired to know that they can overcome breast cancer and there's life after breast cancer. What I always remember about Dr. King is just seeing him on the forefront. Seeing him on the forefront, locked arm in arm, and these are pictures that I have when I was even much younger up until when, you know, when um, Dr. King passed. But um, just that he was just such a monumental leader and that he put others before himself. And he just always was on the forefront, no matter what the risks were, you know, guiding and leading and directing the community. And like I said, I think when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, once I you know, got through my treatment, the first thing I did say to myself and my coworker, what can we do? What can we do? And that's when we started Googling, looking for an African-American support group, survivorship group. I felt as though God was really using me as a vessel. I really did, and I still feel that way, and that's why I do what I do. I think for me, the biggest impact was when we did receive a call from Every Woman's Life, which is a state funded program here in the state of Virginia. And you know, they can't reveal any information as far as the individual or their diagnosis. But they said to us, you all were in a neighborhood not too long ago and you left a bag on a door and the young lady had been trying to get a mammogram for some time and her insurance did not cover mammograms and she could not afford a mammogram. And she took out your resource list 
and she called us. And so we reached out to her and we set her up for a mammogram. And that young lady was diagnosed with breast cancer. But the good news is it was caught early. And for me, that just let me know that what we're doing in the community is working because I look at that as the possibility that we saved a life. Now we are in a new phase, and that is a phase where we are seeking genuine equality, where we are dealing with hard economic and social issues. And I think Dr. King would be hurt over the fact that we're still talking about this all these years, but I think he would be proud of the people that are standing up for justice and standing up against health disparities. We are all one people and we need to recognize that and love each other like Dr. King loved everyone and be leaders in the community. During, during that time, I had the, I was chosen to go represent SNCC at a meeting with John Lewis when he organized a meeting there. And, and there I met Lord Martin Luther King there and I heard the music, We Shall Overcome for the first time at that church. And so I was privy to all of that, all that wonderful thing that was happening then. I realized that this was a great person that had done, you know, had done a lot of good things. In the March on Washington, which I had to go because of what I'd done in the past. I went there by myself and was there when he, was, when he gave the speech, I have a dream. And I appreciate him more now because of all he tried to do. He just didn't stay in his lane as a Baptist preacher. He spoke about politics, Vietnam War, and all those things that they didn't want him to speak about, that he was ready to talk about injustice, wherever it was. Amid COVID-19 and social unrest, this year has been one of remarkable progress for issues advocated by our honoree for the Beloved Community Award for Policy and Social Unrest. It is presented to Delegate Dolores McQuinn. Delegate McQuinn is a staunch advocate for racial and social justice and has served in the Virginia General Assembly since 2009. During the 2020 Virginia Legislative Session, she introduced and championed the passage of House Bill 1537. It overturned a decades-old state law that protects Confederate monuments and gives local governments the freedom to make decisions about them. There are many quotes that Dr. King had, but um, this one that seemed to be so profound for me, he said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by law. And I think that that has motivated me in so many ways. And it's, it's a message for all of us. I would believe the biggest um, impact that, that, that he has had on my life is certainly public service. I started probably when I was around 11 years old. My uh, church and the pastor was very engaged in the civil rights movement. He was an attended Virginia Union. And so at that time, they were very, very much involved. And so the, I was asked at that time to um, come into the city and actually support a candidate that was running for city council. That candidate happened to have been uh, who we, we know as Senator Henry Marsh at the time. But over the years, many things have changed since my childhood uh, that has been uh, good for just uh, humankind, period. And, um, and I, I can see where generations, um, if we can get it right, they would applaud us um, in, in terms of our efforts to make sure that we are bringing people together, that there's a bonding going on, that people are beginning to not just tolerate one another, but accept one another um, as a human being. I have been so impressed this year by the images and the pictures and, you know, of people finally say, walking together and not getting weary in it, the process 
I have, have had the opportunity to spend significant time with some of the protesters and to hear, you know, these very young intellectual beings um, be, you know, feeling and, and being de just determined in their efforts. And I often tell um, young people and, and, and others, I said, you know, just find your corner of the world. You don't have to take the whole world and, and, and serve the entire world. Find a small corner and begin to affect change in that corner, whatever you desire or however you desire to get it done. Uh, and then if you want to expand on that, do it. But there is no limitation. There are no limited you know, uh, opportunities for us to give back. And I think in many ways that that's what Dr. King was saying, greatness is about serve. And those are words too, biblical words, you know, that uh, greatness come, come from how you're going to give back and, and sacrifice some of your own time, your talents, and even treasures for that matter. Dr. Martin Luther King, he looks over us. Cause every night that we walk the city of Richmond, every night as we're voicing our, not even opinions, our freedom of speech, cause that's what we have. We have the right to speak out loud, to say what we demand. We're demanding respect. We're not asking for it. We're demanding respect as much as you demand respect. I look at Black Lives Matter in Richmond and the story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The fact that he never settled for less makes me know that what I'm doing is right. And if it seems wrong to other people, it's because you're on the wrong side of justice. The MLK Legacy Award this year goes to the Honorable L. Douglas Wilder. For most of us, this remarkable man hardly needs an introduction. He has been a towering presence in Virginia and its capital city, Richmond, for most of his life. He was born right here in Richmond, a grandson of slaves who was named after abolitionist Frederick Douglass. He attended segregated schools and then Virginia Union University, graduating with a degree in chemistry. He earned a Bronze Star for heroism in the Korean War, earned a law degree from Howard University, and then became the first African-American state senator in Virginia since Reconstruction. In 1985, he was elected the first African-American lieutenant governor in Virginia, and in 1990, he became the first African-American to be elected governor of any U.S. state. Later, he became the first directly elected mayor of Richmond in six decades. Governor Wilder embodies both Dr. King's hopes and his ideals. My favorite Dr. King quote, I paraphrase it by saying, when a thing is right, the time is always right. I think he said, the time is always right to do what is right. But it means the same thing to me, and I have tried to practice that throughout my life. Well, we were nearly the same age. I think he was a couple of years older. Our birthdays are pretty much separated by a couple of days. What he believed in impacted me more than his life because he didn't exist before I did. We were contemporaries. I learned a lot from what he was doing and found it inspiring to what I was trying to do myself. I never wanted to go into politics. I never wanted to go into smiling and grinning and asking for votes and begging for money. And yet, I came to recognize that unless things changed, uh, my life would not change. The lives of others would not change. And people like King and his predecessor, Vernon Johns, uh, who had that church, who was a Virginian, brilliant man from Virginia Union as well. Uh, they believed in demanding what was right and criticizing what was wrong. And I found that I did a lot of that. And when I came back to Richmond to practice law, I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I saw from every angle. I didn't like what was taking place with the political groups. They were not demanding, I thought, what was writing. They were supporting. 
oh, they were lending their votes. But I found we were getting little in return. And so I said, I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to try to do this. And so that's why I said I lost my mind, because it's demanding. If you're going to do what's right for the people, you have to give your time, you have to give your effort. And that means that you sacrifice other things. You sacrifice the things that you would want to do for yourself, for your family. And I did that. Uh, some of them being threatened in school when I opposed the state song, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. Uh, my kids would come back and they were in Mary Munford School or some other school of uh, elementary level. And they were ostracized. Uh, people would be upset with them, with their white students. Why? Daddy did something wrong. He did something bad. What did he do? Uh, cross burned in front of my house. Uh, and the kinds of things that would go about when people saying, well, you did that. You'll never be elected to anything else. Why, you said, get rid of that song. Carry me back to old Virginia. The lamentation of a slave saying that he wanted to come back and be reunited with old Massa. That's where the old darkies hard and long to go. There's where I labored so hard for old Massa. That song was the state song of Virginia, but it didn't become the state song until 1944, which means this was not back in the Civil War days. This was Virginia's commitment to racism. In old Virginia, the state where I was born, was born, was born. Right after the war, the World War, that they said was fought to free all of the people of the world. And so with those kinds of things going on still in my mind, as I got into the state senate, I said, look, I, I'm going to stay here for a while, but I'm going to move up and out. When I said I was going to run for lieutenant governor, they said they knew I was crazy. Not here in Virginia. And people said, well, we can make, maybe fix it so you can be the state party chairman. I said, oh, yeah, you can do that for the next guy. But I'm going to run. And as a result of it, I traveled to every city and every county in Virginia. Every end of, I took 60 days and said, I'm not going to stop until I go to every one of them. I was campaigning in a place in Southwest Virginia, and I was, uh, obviously this was a time when everybody was speaking about abortion and whether it might be a throwback to it. And I had been advised by a friend of mine who was in the Senate from there, white fellow, good friend of mine, and he said, Doug, when you go into these places, you got to go into every shop because if you go in to stop at a barber shop and don't go into the next one somebody's gonna know about it if you hit one store and you don't go to the one up the road the bread man's gonna go up and tell him wilder's down at that store these people were expecting you to come there so I, I did went into everyone he said when you go there you have to shake everybody's hand so i did and in one store i was coming out and it shook everybody's hand and so somebody said you didn't shake that man's hand over there and I said, well, you're right. And I went over and this guy was sitting on top of this barrel and he had on bib overalls, uh, the tobacco stains creasing, coming through his mouth, straw hat, red bandana around his neck. I said, hello, sir, I'm Doug Wild. I'm running for governor. He said, I have something I want to ask you. I said, well, that's why I'm here. He said, I want to talk to you about this abortion. I said, oh my goodness, I could have gotten out of here without talking to this man. And he said, before I could give him, so I was prepared to give him my Jeffersonian response. Government has no right to interfere in the most personal or personal relationships with a woman. And I said, oh, he said, ain't no man's business, no way, is it? I said, wow, you're right. It convinced me that you couldn't judge people by how they look, how they look, how they talk, where they live. And I said, at this late stage in my life, for me to have to be reconnected with recognizing that, was a reawakening experience for me. I, I Lawrence, Lawrence Douglas Wilder, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I today I get letters from people from all over the country. They are inspired by knowing that I had little to start with. They feel that I have accomplished. But what it means to me is that they see that a state that did not permit people to go to school 
could produce the first black governor in the United States. We still have the attitude of love. We still... The step is a question of America recognizing what its history is and making certain that we allocate our resources to doing that. There, and it's not by steps as such, it's by actions. And so it, it's one thing to have a holiday for Dr. King once a day, once a year. The question is, when are we going to get to the, part, the point of recognizing that we are always going to be different in terms of race, we're always going to be different in terms of gender, but we don't have to be different with the way government affects the differences in terms of allocations of money for schools, for education, for health, for housing, for jobs, for employment, for the judiciary. Those things need to be ended tomorrow, if not today. Do it when? Now! What is the problem that we got to wait for? Do it now. As long as there is, has been an MLK, the reverberation and the fallout, the good and the positive results are coming from now and on and on and on and on. As long as there are people living and find out about what Martin Luther King has done, that's going to influence them. And there'll be other movements in other places at other times, but it will come back to that base. Martin Luther King, behold, the dreamer cometh. Go ye out to meet him and he's gonna be there for us. Congratulations to each of the honorees today. We encourage you to remember and reflect on the work and legacy of Dr. King as we all work together to further his dream of a beloved community. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, oh, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking Watching to the freedom land Ain't gonna let segregation turn me around Oh, oh turn me around Ain't gonna let segregation turn me around I'm gonna keep on walking Keep on talking. Marching to the freedom land. Ain't gonna let race hatred turn me around. Oh, oh, turn me around. Ain't gonna let race hatred turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking. Keep on talking. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching to the freedom land. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me No, 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 nobody. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking. Freedom land.